So welcome everybody and, and thank you so much for the first uh, speaker, Professor Young, because this was really wonderful and a very good introduction for a clinical application because I'm coming from the clinical side. And of course, we are dreaming in this case to print uh, by a, um, print the tooth. Um, and I will just show you now, introduce you now why we do that and why we are working on it with a multidisciplinary uh, team, as you just mentioned that we need that. Um, in fact, all of us are already confronted uh, with losing a tooth probably. And the most um, yeah, crucial thing is when we would lose that tooth in the frontal area, where we have um, yeah, an aesthetic problem, uh, apart from probably also social and a talking problem. And especially uh, when this happens with children, which is like one on the three children can fall on the teeth, this can cause a real problem. In adults, you can easily replace um, such uh, a lost tooth by an implant, which is usually titanium that osteointegrates in the bone. Unfortunately, uh, with children, this type of osteointegration will not work because you have a growth of the dental alveolar complex. That means that bone and teeth erupt together. And therefore, we have introduced the tooth autotransplantation. Believe me or not, but this is already a uh, long time existing. It's existing since um, the time of the Egyptian pharaohs. And even 4,000 years ago, you could already have um, donor teeth from slaves going to the pharaohs who had lost the teeth by a trauma or maybe a fight. So that is not a novel technique. But um, almost 15 years ago, we introduced a technique that was like image-based uh, printing of the tooth, not yet bioprinting, image-based printing of the tooth, as such that we could match better based on 3D images of the patient to much better prepare the surgery and provide also long-term outcome. I will show, shortly introduce you to the concept. So you see again the same um, patient, a pediatric patient who had um, unfortunately yeah, a trauma as such, usually with a bicycle or um, something like um, similar sport activities. But anyway, one tooth could be saved, but the other tooth was permanently lost. And uh, if you want to uh, take a tooth from the same patient, you usually go and collect a premolar tooth, which is in the same or the opposite jaw uh, there, which can be missed by a further orthodontic treatment. And then you bring this tooth to the frontal area. To do so in the most bio-viable way that the cells can survive, and these are stem cells which you take for the, from the periodontal ligament, that's the ligament around the tooth, when you do so, you bring that here in this um, anterior area and you want to do that, as I say, with the most atraumatic uh, means so ever. And to do so, uh, we actually print the donor tooth. So we actually do a complete planning and then a printing of the donor tooth. And we use the donor tooth as a kind of replica just for preparing the surgery. And just like at the very end, then we take this tooth. I just show you in the next process how this works from a technical point of view. So we as clinicians, we will use planning. And at the moment, as um, our Professor Young said already, we do uh, this with AI-based uh, software. And we will go and select the best donor tooth fitting in this anterior area, both anatomically aesthetically, as well as from an orthodontic planning point of view. And then the segmentation is fully automated at the moment. So it's AI based on development. And then we go for the printing of this donor tooth, which will fit and mimic fully the donor tooth. And we will work with the plastic until the, um, yeah, the socket is prepared and ideally fitting to the real donor. And at that moment, then we actually will use the planning and the plastic replica in the mouth of the child to um, prepare the socket to then fit 
the real donor tooth to immediately place it as such that the stem cells, which we will later on uh, use for regeneration, the stem cells in the periodontal ligament will uh, optimally survive. So nowadays, in less than 30 seconds, you can take the tooth from the premolar area to the frontal area and let it heal in that situation. And then you get a result like you see here, before and after, which is based on composite material, the kind of yeah, remake of this premolar tooth to fit and to look like the neighboring incisor teeth in the front zone. And we followed it up already for many years. And here you see a typical example, even of a patient after nine years with nine years of even growth of this tooth in the other region. So you see here the donor tooth and here the original incisor tooth of the other side of the mouth. And you see that they are really looking alike. You see here the composite uh, material that they are really uh, looking very similar. But obviously this is not the end. Obviously we would like, would like to, to um, further move into that direction using bioprinting. We would love to have like bioprinting of bone and, and also finally bioprinting of teeth because this would not only solve this problem for children where implants do not apply but actually all of us could maybe be served when we lose a tooth by having a tooth bioprinted. Unfortunately and it is a little bit the same question that has been asked about um, how far are we from um, yeah printing a heart well, in fact, the tooth is also a very complex uh, structure. And I named here a few of these elements because it's a dental alveolar complex. That means it's a tooth and the alveolar bone around. So you have like collagen fibers in the periodontal ligament, which you see here. You have like nerves and blood vessels. You have bone, but the tooth has also cementum, enamel, um, dentin, and that makes it a very complex structure to have a whole process for bioprinting the tooth. And so we are in the beginning. Luckily, and even in our own area of the mouth, we have also the wisdom teeth. And the wisdom teeth have an advantage that not only this periodontal ligament that I explained, but also the follicle of this wisdom tooth has actually very potential, pluripotential stem cells which may help us to actually generate all of these tissues because the follicle indeed of the tooth is there to make the tooth. That means it has inherently all the wisdom and the coding for all of these structures. It is just like our previous colleague said, probably only the right recipe and with all the ingredients, both temperature, and a uh, type of bio inks we use, uh, the pressure on the cells and all those different elements that we have to assemble as such that we are sure to make the very right uh, protocol for printing the right tooth on the right place. And so we are just there in the beginning. We are busy for it with, uh, for um, I think for four years now, but the process is slow and you have to do a lot of work more. I mean, it's more difficult than printing cartilage and it's definitely more difficult than printing um, bone as well. In our own skeletal engineering lab from uh, uh, Professor Leut and Sieris and others who are working there, we collaborate with them, but the cartilage and the bone definitely are yeah, less complex structures than the tooth. And of course, we have started already and use different machines um, that are available on the market. But we have also this three-dimensional problem with the different um, yeah, elements to print. And we have used different uh, uh, materials apart from hydrogels, also others. Because once you print the crown in the shape of, um, not a crown, but the root in the shape of the root, you may have problems with this height of the construct as such. So we are still figuring out and um, we have got different engineers working on it together with clinicians who are then doing the more clinical and animal part of the research. 
And so one of these things we have explored and we are currently using is also the, the Hitosand, um, just also um, to see this animal and, and fungal uh, hitosan as part of the bio-ink uh, to develop. And of course, as you print it in the body, you don't want it to stay there, but you want it to be bioresolvable and replaced by um, the own cells making the new tooth in the right shape of the root and fitting aesthetically and biomechanically the rest of the teeth and the jaw function as such. So you have to look to degradation, you have to look to actually the swelling in wet circumstance because of course the, the oral cavity is uh, full of saliva and um, so you have to have a lot more factors even for the tooth considering the area where you will uh, have it uh, placed afterwards. Huh? Shape fi fidelity is also another way that you have to look for considering not only the specific outer contour, but definitely also the pulpal um, canal, which is often a 60 to 70 micrometer thin canal in the center of each tooth. So this has a lot of extra requirements, uh, not only in the, um, in the bio ink itself, but probably also in the printer, and definitely also in the original images, which may derive from the same patient, uh, but for example, you take the shape of the opposite, the contralateral, the mirror tooth, with exactly the same place as the one that you want to, to have. And then you can model it. But inside this part of the 60, 70 micrometers, there you still have to have place enough for the cells developing nerves and blood vessels. So a lot of tricky things, uh, come here uh, on the spot. And so, as I said, we have several um, PhD and um, yeah, engineering master students uh, helping us with the different parts of this entire recipe puzzle. And uh, one of these PhD students is here, uh, Mehdi, uh, who is um, working, concentrating at the moment at this, uh, making this bio inks bio printable specifically for the question of the root of the tooth in the mouth. So it's a whole way where combining different materials, especially this uh, animal and fungal hitosan with uh, gelatin, um, also with the genepin, and then uh, just looking for the real uh, right uh, recipe at all moments, looking to many um, aspects, as you can see here, this uh, the degradation again with different concentrations of genepin, but at the same time also um, yeah, looking uh, in fact to, um, yeah, to different aspects such as has been said before, the cell viability and later on uh, also the printability as such. So this whole thing is also part of uh, another um, person's work, namely Mustafa Ezeldin, who will in his postdoc period also further work with it because he's the one that um, established with us the autotransplantation and now wants to move to this uh, uh, bioprinting sector. So he's already working on that and will continue in his postdoc or doing this work also preliminary in uh, animal uh, research, which he's already doing. And typically we use at all moments is uh, follicular and sometimes also pulpal and periodontal stem cells because they are so powerful and so easy to get because everyone has them in their own mouth. But I still consider this concept as a kind of, it's not just food making, it's like uh, making maybe a souffle where everything uh, needs to be exactly right and uh, uh, exactly uh, assembled. So we use this micro extrusion at the moment but probably every single little component has to be checked before this is going to work. So I think we speak here about a full decade um, ahead of us to further develop that. And with that, I would like to thank you for uh, listening. Uh, this is our research group. We also do a lot with the imaging uh, as a basis of this bioprinting. Um, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>